But now let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing, but Satan's underlings or strangers tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. Our fine shepherd tells us as our first example, these words at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919 and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. So what's the implication? Obviously, even now, Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. But what does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. And who often have the loudest voice promoting this false message? Apostates. Yes, there we have it. The A word. (laughs) It was always going in this direction, wasn't it? So yes, this is the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. And Stephen Lett is cutting to the chase here. He is identifying apostates, people like yours truly, who have left the Jehovah's Witness religion as being Satan's underlings. We're agents of Satan, apparently, under his control. Satan, of course, being the great ventriloquist. And what's happening here is Stephen Lett is proceeding with this rant where he says a number of things about former Jehovah's Witnesses or apostates, whatever you want to call them, some of which are true, some of which aren't really true. For example, he says, What does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. Now, without wishing to brag, I am fairly well known as an apostate, as a former Jehovah's Witness. In fact, I've been doing this now for over 10 years. My channel's quite well known when it comes to exposing Jehovah's Witnesses and exploring their teachings and policies from a critical perspective. I've never once said, don't trust the faithful slave, he will mislead you. I don't think Stephen let or the governing body, are the faithful slave. That's a claim they're making. It's not a claim I'm making. They're claiming to be God's channel. I'm not saying don't listen to God's channel. Don't listen to God's appointed faithful slave. I cannot say that because I don't believe they are the faithful slave. So what he's doing here is he is straw manning apostates. He is putting words in the mouth of apostates like me. And this is, by definition, deception. We're going to see this actually throughout his rant, where he commits the very crimes, for want of a better word, that he's accusing apostates of. A great example is where he quotes from Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47. In fact, if Tibor is gracious, maybe we can read on. Maybe we can get some context here and read to the end of verse 51. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? 
Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. But if ever that evil slave says in his heart, my master is delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and in an hour that he does not know, and he will punish him with the greatest severity and will assign him his place with the hypocrites. There is where his weeping and the gnashing of his teeth will be. So what we've done here is we've read the verse in context. Interestingly, you're going to see as Stephen Lett's rant continues, one of the things he's going to bemoan about apostates like me is that we apparently take things out of context. You'll just have to take my word for it. You're going to see evidence of this momentarily. But that's one of the things that he criticizes apostates for. Well, what's he done here? He's just cut off the quote. He's just cut off the words of Jesus at a point that is convenient to him and left out the context which calls into question his authority or adds ambiguity to this faithful and discreet slave narrative. Interestingly, I actually did a sushi on this. Sushi 230. Cook insists Christ's evil slave parable is just a warning. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. Fellow governing body member Kenneth Cook got up on the annual meeting platform recently and said the following. Please note that Jesus was not prophesying that there would be an evil slave. This is a warning, not a prophecy. So let's get this straight. The part of Matthew 24 that's convenient to the Jehovah's Witness leadership is a prophecy. But when it starts saying things that are uncomfortable for the Jehovah's Witness leadership that suggest that a slave, that people who have prominence in God's organization might become corrupt, once it starts saying that, it's no longer a prophecy. It switches from being a prophecy to just a warning. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to swallow. And we're considering this verse because it's being used by Stephen Lett in a rant against apostates that will blame apostates for taking things out of context. You, could, you couldn't make it up, could you? Just the hypocrisy of it is eye-watering and even if we put the evil slave thing to one side, I think it's worthwhile considering some other words of Jesus found at Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone saying to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but only the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and perform many powerful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, what Stephen Lett is doing, what indeed the whole of the governing body are doing in proclaiming themselves to be the faithful and discreet slave is they are self-certifying themselves as spokespersons for God. They are self-certifying themselves as followers of Jesus. But Jesus himself supposedly 
warned against people who would do this, even though they were workers of lawlessness, even though they were doing things that were not the will of my Father who is in the heavens. I'm obviously atheist. I don't actually consider myself Christian anymore. But if you do consider yourself Christian, I think the question you need to be asking is, would it be the will of the Father? Would it be the will of God for families to be separated by mandate of a religious leadership, for children to be abused and their abuse covered up on a database that the authorities have no access to, and for people to even be persuaded to die rather than accept certain medical procedures? Would that be the will of the Father? I think that the words in Matthew 7, if you happen to be a believer, if you happen to be a Christian, and especially if you happen to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you do well to give some careful thought to whether those words might apply to people like Stephen Lett, to people like Tony Morris and David Splain, who preside over so many lies and so much corruption and so much misery that they export on people's lives. And it's worth commenting as well, the presuppositional reasoning that Stephen Lett uses, especially where he says, We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919. How do we know that? Where is the evidence? He's just said something. He's just made an outlandish claim and offered no evidence whatsoever. This is presuppositional reasoning. It's asking you to take something as a given. As I've repeatedly said on this channel, and it's not my words, it's a well-known phrase, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If Stephen Lett really wants us to think that Jesus chose the faithful and discreet slave in 1919, where is his evidence? There is no evidence. There isn't even any Bible verse that even remotely points to 1919. There's nothing linking the years 1914 and 1919 in terms of periods of time described in the Bible. There's nothing. There is absolutely nothing. But isn't this the whole point? Isn't this the reason why Stephen Lett wants you to be a sheep? Especially if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Especially if you are following him or listening to his voice. The reason why he wants you to be terrified of the voice of strangers, particularly the voice of people like me, apostates who question his teachings, the reason why he wants you to be so scared is because his words don't make any sense. He cannot offer you any evidence whatsoever for some of the foundational teachings of the Jehovah's Witness religion. He cannot prove the theology behind 1914. He cannot prove that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607. And he sure as hell can't prove that Jesus chose the faithful and discreet slave in 1919 when there isn't even a Bible verse that can be pointed to in support of that teaching. Hebrews 13.9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles, or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Those are both bald-faced lies. Acts 20.30 says that apostates speak twisted things. They do this in order to draw God's sheep away and make them followers of themselves. Something that's twisted 
is bent out of shape or distorted. Wow, thank you for explaining what twisted means, Stephen. I'm really expanding my vocabulary with this show. They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. 2 Peter 2.3 says, They will greedily exploit you with counterfeit words. A counterfeit is something that's carefully designed to look like the real thing. Seriously, who needs Sesame Street when we've got Stephen giving us all of these definitions? Take, for example, counterfeit money. It might look genuine, but it's fake and thus worthless. If we're deceived into accepting it, we'll lose money. But if we're deceived into accepting the counterfeit words of apostate, we'll lose our life. Ah, oh, a death threat. How charming. And apostates will give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. Can you imagine really needing a loving shepherding visit and asking apostates to give you one? Wow. So much to unpack there. I hardly know where to start. Let's start at the end, shall we, at the words that are still fresh in our minds and work backwards from there. So, Stephen, let's knock out punch when it comes to dismissing apostates as people who shouldn't be listened to as the voice of strangers is that they give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. We don't need to offer a surrogate set of beliefs, Stephen Lett. We don't need to take your lies and say, hey, we'll give you even better lies. We don't need to come up with some alternative theology to dupe people with. What apostates like myself offer is simply the freedom to think for yourself. That's what we're offering. And it's not something you have to take. If you'd prefer to have clowns like Stephen Lett micromanage your life for you, go right ahead. I won't lose any sleep. But if you're of the mindset that you don't appreciate being exploited and lied to, I would recommend being in control of your own mind and being in control of your own life. And that will always be infinitely better than any fantasy that Stephen Lett has to offer, than any shepherding visits. I mean, apparently... That's, that's where we're going wrong. Apostates need to be offering shepherding visits in order for our arguments to make sense. It doesn't even deserve a response. What a ludicrous suggestion. If you need help with your mental health, if you're depressed or anxious or feeling the effects of some kind of trauma, which, let's be honest, this organization is usually the cause of, if you need help with your mental health, go to a professional. That, <laughs> that's what people like myself are saying. We're not saying that you should follow us. We're not saying that we should visit your home and give you shepherding visits, we're saying that you are strong enough to look after yourself. And if you're not strong enough, the people to help you with your mental health are trained mental health professionals. And we're also saying that rather than believing in things just because you want them to be true, Rather than believing in fantasies involving pandas and watermelons that conveniently allow Stephen Lett to have control over you, why don't you apply critical thinking? Why don't you decide for yourself what your beliefs are based on the facts, based on logic and reason? That's the alternative that people like myself are offering. 
we're certainly not suggesting that you should come and follow us. But isn't it interesting that it's we apostates who are apparently in the business of twisting things? They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. I'm just going to say it now. Stephen Lett makes himself guilty of all of these things in this very broadcast. Stephen Lett has already taken out of context the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 regarding the faithful and discreet slave and the warning regarding the evil slave He's already taken that out of context when we're talking about leaving out vital details. There's an example of him doing precisely this here. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. So we have two examples of strange teachings. Number one, the faithful slave protects pedophiles. And number two, the slave will exploit you so that they can live lives of luxury. This first claim, the faithful slave protects pedophiles, Again, as I've argued, I'm not calling them the faithful slave. They can call themselves that if they want, but I don't call them the faithful slave. I'll call them the governing body if that's the title that they insist on, but I don't think they were chosen by Jesus. But as for this claim about protecting pedophiles, that is absolutely true because they keep a database of those accused of child sexual abuse, and this is something that they don't even try to deny. They've nowhere said in their videos or in their literature, we don't keep a database of those accused of child abuse. And the reason that they're not going to do that is because this database, there's documented evidence to support it. In Australia, when... Australia had its Royal Commission. They went to Watchtower Australia and they pulled records of 1,006 perpetrators of child abuse from the database in Australia. And there's even indications in the Shepherd Book, the manual that elders have in their briefcases, that records are kept when it comes to those accused of child abuse. So there's documented evidence about this and examples of where people have actually had partial access to the database. That is quintessentially protecting pedophiles. Because if you are keeping a list of accused pedophiles and not passing that on to the authorities, what you're doing is you are protecting pedophiles by making it so that they don't face justice and are therefore in a position to accrue more victims. That's, I'm sorry, there's no other way to describe it. And yet apparently that's a bald-faced lie. But what Stephen Lett hasn't done there is give details. He's just made a statement and he's not given, what was the word, he's not given vital details so that Jehovah's Witnesses can have clarity and transparency regarding this particular issue, this profoundly important issue that he's just skirting over. And I mentioned before straw manning. Straw manning is where you put an argument in your opponent's mouth that isn't what they've said. Apparently one thing that I'm doing as an apostate is saying that the slave will exploit you so that they can live lives of luxury. Well, that's quite a sweeping statement, and it's not something I've said in so many words on this channel. 
I do think that Stephen Lett lives a life of luxury. I think that's manifestly obvious when you consider the position they're in. These are men who want for nothing, who fly around the world and are received everywhere they go by doting followers. They don't have to worry about paying bills. They get all of their meals and their accommodation provided for them. They don't seem to be lacking when it comes to their budget for jewellery <laughs> and Rolex watches and, in Sam Hurd's case, womb chairs. So they do seem to have money to spend, in Tony Morris's case, on very fine whiskey, in Stephen Lett's case, on real estate investments, which I'll come to. But I have not said on this channel, because I can't prove it, and I don't say things that I can't prove, I have not said that this is all just some huge racket. It could be. That might be something that comes out of the closet in the future. But as of now, we do not have direct evidence, documented evidence, that the members of the governing body are personally enriching themselves directly from dedicated funds from money that gets contributed to the organization. For all we know, they're making their money through some other means. We, we just don't know. We can't say that with any certainty. I understand that there will be some who do say that. But personally speaking, that's not a line of argument that I go down. They do live lives of luxury, yes. But to what extent... Are they profiting from their followers? I think that that's ambiguous. And I've always had roughly that position on this channel. So what he's doing is he is twisting the words of apostates. He's strawmanning apostates, putting words in the mouths of apostates, and essentially living up to the very criticisms that he's directing at apostates, and regarding that part about taking things out of context, we've already discussed the way Matthew 24 was taken out of context. What about Hebrews 13 verse 9? Hebrews 13 9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Hebrews 13 verse 9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Does it now, Stephen Lett? Isn't it interesting that that verse doesn't get quoted so that people can make their own minds up regarding that verse? Let's read it, shall we? Hebrews 13 verse 9, Do not be led astray by various and strange teachings. For it is better for the heart to be strengthened by undeserved kindness than by foods which do not benefit those occupied with them. <laughs> Maybe I've missed something, viewers, but I haven't seen anywhere in that verse the Apostle Paul say that the strange teachings are false messages or false teachings. It's actually quite ambiguous as to what he means. And interestingly, there's a footnote for the verse uh, next to where it says about foods. It says that is rules about food. So evidently, the strange teachings that are being referred to here are strange or various ideas regarding dietary restrictions of some kind. That's To say that that's directly calling out false messages from apostates is at best a stretch and at worst outright misleading, twisting of the scriptures and taking the words of the Bible out of context, which is, again, exactly the sort of shady behaviour Stephen Lett is accusing apostates of. 
I think ultimately what we have here is an organization in full on panic mode. The more they jump up and down about apostates, the more they point to the bogeyman under the bed, the more they try to terrify Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to criticism of the organization and the need to avoid it, the more desperate they show themselves to be. They obviously did it at last year's 2021 convention. In fact, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to a video. Everything they said about apostates at the 2021 convention, they really went to town at that particular convention with the whole fear-mongering surrounding apostates. And now we see Stephen Lett revisiting this. I, I mean, were Jehovah's Witnesses just not paying attention the first time round? Why the need for the repetition? It was literally the 2021 convention when you were saying all this, and now you're saying it all again. Your criticisms of apostates are frankly what we heard already, only last year. Is this an admission on your part that the sheep... Jehovah's Witnesses aren't paying attention to you. Are you losing control? That's the feeling I'm getting. But what I really want Jehovah's Witnesses to take home from this particular rebuttal is how shady they are in their fear-mongering and particularly the way they strawman the apostate position and speak with such vagueness when it comes to criticisms against the organization, leaving out, as they say, vital details. If you're going to counter criticism of your organization, discuss the details. Talk about the precise claims regarding child sexual abuse and show how they are bald-faced lies. Stephen Lett isn't going to do that because he can't do that because they're not bald-faced lies. Mm -hmm.